Hello everyone, welcome back to another video. Today we are taking a look at a piece by E.D. Klumke, uh, who was the original editor of our text. He put it together back in, I think it was 1981, it originally came out in the first edition. Uh, I think Klumke brought out a second edition before Stephen M. Kahn took it over uh, and, and brought out the third and now into the fourth editions of the text. Uh, so, Klemke himself was a 20th century American philosopher. He's at Iowa State for a number of years. Um, this piece that we're actually looking at here today is a, a lecture he gave a few different times. If you look down at the, the footnote right on it, um, down at the bottom, on the first page, uh, it was read in the last lecture series at DePaul University and was repeated apparently three times uh, it was also read as the top prof lecture at Roosevelt University. Uh, so he, he gave this piece on a number of occasions to a uh, wide, wide audience, um, really student event kind of things. Um, we have a similar sort of lecture series here at the, the University of Lethbridge, where popular uh, professors give a talk on something that's of, of general interest, something that everybody can uh, um, understand and, and engage with, you know, it's not just designed for narrow specialists in a particular area. So in this piece, Klemke does a few things. So the, the piece is fairly well organized and I want to follow Klemke's overall organization of it. Um, he articulates what he calls transcendentalism, so a particular kind of view. It's, it's going to be very, in, in some sense, quite familiar from the theistic responses we've already looked at. Um, Klemke claims there's really three parts of the of transcendentalism. So there are these three component theses, uh, and he thinks that they're all somehow unconvincing, they, they lack evidence to make them believable, uh, or they're really indecisive uh, um, or, or unnecessary for the creation of individual meaning. And then finally, he argues that it's our consciousness that allows us to imbue things with, with value and meaning, uh, and that's really got to be the origin of any meaning life can have. It has to be something that we ourselves produce. Uh, so in this, he is like Edward, certainly to some degree. We're going to see a little bit more coming out of Klumke in terms of uh, some of the reasons he's providing, as well as uh, some distinctions he's drawing. There's some overlap here with Edwards, but there are also some interesting differences. So with that, let's just go ahead and jump right into it. So transcendentalism. This view that he wants to um, really talk about and, and ultimately criticize, it's really this uh, view that, that God or the transcendent, you know, we can, we can use whatever word we want. God is a fairly um, easy word for it. But, you know, we can call it the ultimate or the infinite like Tolstoy or all sorts of other things. Um, Transcendentalism, according to Klemke, is really the view that um, God or, or whatever that being is, whatever that sort of ultimate transcendent thing that, that goes beyond uh, the existence of the material world as we know it, is really required for the universe to have meaning, uh, not just the universe, but I suppose for all of us as well. So maybe if I want to be really particular, I should revise that, that first bullet point. Not just the universe, but the universe and anything really in the universe. Uh, Klemke claims that this is an all or nothing position. So he, he puts it this way in the text. He says, it is an all or nothing position. Its central thesis is that of a trans transcendent ultimate of absolute supremacy, which reigns over all finite things and power, and which alone is capable of providing meaning and worth to human existence. Finite historical centers can at best bring temporary assistance. They all wither with time and circumstances. Only when men turn from the finite to the infinite, can they find, in the words of Kierkegaard, a hope and anticipation of the eternal which holds together all the cleavages of existence. And cleavages of existence is really uh, Kierkegaard's phrase. And what's that really? Uh, well, we can think about you know, all, all the pain and suffering and misery and, and disappointment that we've been um, talking about. You know, Schopenhauer really highlights, but Buddhism talks about, and we've seen Edwards uh, as well as others admit, like all human lives have have this. Uh, there's no such thing as a human life that's just 
completely blissful with absolutely no pain or suffering or disappointment or anything like that, right? So the view of transcendentalism is really that the only way for human life, the universe in general, um, whatever we might want to think of, the only way for it to have meaning is for this being to exist. Right? Klemke goes a little bit further and he says that there are really three component theses of transcendentalism. And he's going to criticize each of them, so we're just going to articulate them here and then uh, we'll see the criticisms as we move forward. So first, there exists a transcendent being or ultimate with which man can enter into some sort of relation. So the first thesis is really just a, an existence hypothesis, right? There is such a being there uh, and it's a kind of being that we can have some kind of relation, relationship, um, whatever we want to call it. Second, without such a transcendent ultimate, in relation to faith to it, human life lacks meaning, purpose, and integration. Uh, we're going to see Klemke is going to target all three of those subparts, uh, meaning and purpose and integration, so we're going to hear a bit more about that. And lastly, without such meaning or integration, human life is just not worthwhile. Uh, and so one, one thing I want to draw attention to here, because uh, you know, we've been moving through this course, the meaning of life. Uh, and of course, there's this big looming question, right? What do we mean by meaning? <laughs> um, we can certainly talk about the meaning of words, phrases, sentences, um, where we're trying to communicate with each other. You don't really understand what somebody is trying to communicate to you until you understand the meaning of what it is. So to get the meaning, depending on what kind of claim it is, uh, might just be understanding the reference. Uh, understanding the descriptions of state of affairs going on might be something more than that, might be something deeper. Uh, we haven't heard, and I think this is, this is something interesting as well as a little bit telling, we haven't heard a lot of people really uh, try to diagnose and define exactly what, what meaning is. And in some sense, I'm hoping what you and, and I can be doing through this course is really trying to figure out and articulate what, what meaning in the sense is. We're talking about you know, the meaning of life. What do we mean by meaning? Well, here, just looking at that third point um, and, and the second point, we've got meaning set off from purpose and integration, and it's also set off from human life being worthwhile. So at least on the view Klemke's putting forward, it seems like he's assuming meaning is something separate from worthwhileness, separate from purpose, separate from integration. Now, of course, we've certainly been hearing about, uh, in particular, I think, having purposes or goals, having something to work towards. I think that's a very natural sense. We're talking about somebody's meaning or the meaning of their life, what sorts of goals or purposes that they have. Another one is, is this worthwhileness. Is it worth doing? Is it pleasurable or enjoyable in and of itself? Now, so one view, and I'm just going to put this out here now, we're going to hear more follow up on this next week when we're looking at particularly uh, subjectivity and, and some of the other answers we're going to look at then. Um, some views being put forward that really argue that having a meaningful life is really to lead it in a certain kind of way. Uh, when we call a life meaningful, really we say that it's characterized by uh, certain certain features, you know, working towards a goal or, or enjoying what we're doing in a certain special kind of way. So we'll we'll come back to that. But this is just something to to keep in mind as you are reading through and analyzing some of these pieces. What are they assuming? Right? What's what can we tell about how they think based on the way they're framing issues, on the way they're using language? Because those are excellent skills to develop. Right? If you can take what somebody's saying and in some sense, work backwards from that to gain an even fuller understanding of, of how they're thinking about things, how they're approaching problems, what they're assuming, uh, you're gonna be in, in very good shape in terms of trying to understand and, and communicate as well as potentially argue with other people. All right, so let's look at these uh, three theses in turn. So the first one, the existence of the transcendent. So this thesis that the transcendent exists, um, you know, God exists, the ultimate exists, whatever we want to call it, 
and humans can enter into some kind of relation with it. Klemke interprets this as a cognitive assertion. Uh, he puts it this way in the text. A cognitive assertion is a true fact one. It's the kind of thing that can be true or false. What Klemke is really trying to rule out here are um, forms of non-cognitivism. So the cognitive versus non-cognitive distinction is one that concerns really semantics or, or how we interpret meanings of, of words. So, uh, and one thing I'll, I'll quickly note here is that Bayer was making use of this distinction yesterday, uh, though I didn't draw as much attention to it, in part because Bayer himself doesn't spend as much time as, as Klemke does trying to point out and, and clearly define what it is he's talking about. And I think that is in part because the Edwards piece was in the Encyclopedia of Philosophy, and so it's really targeted at a, a philosophy specific audience already, whereas Klemke's piece was aimed at a much broader audience. Uh, in uh, um, normative philosophy, so philosophy concerning values, broadly speaking, there has been a debate, uh, particularly in the, the 20th century, though you can find some rumblings about it in the, the 19th, over the, the semantics or how we ought to interpret the use of language that's concerned with, with value statements. So for instance, moral statements. Uh, emotivism and, and non, other forms of non-cognitivism interpret statements about value and statements about morality really as expressions of our preferences or our feelings. And so just thinking back to Edwards, when Edwards is talking about uh, the pessimists like Schopenhauer, he, what he's saying is, okay, one way that we can interpret what they're, they're really trying to do here is as a form of non-cognitivism. What they're doing is really expressing their own disappointment with life or their own pain and suffering, but they're doing it in terms that make it sound like they're doing more than merely expressing their own feelings. Rather, they're making claims about how the world really is. Now, what Edwards did, and he did it fairly quickly, is he said, okay, I, so I'm gonna interpret these claims really as cognitive claims, as the sorts of claims that can really be true or false, objectively speaking, for everyone. Right? Uh, whether or not it's really the case that death is better than life's sake. Cognitive assertions are ones that are, in, in some sense, normal assertions that are true or false in a usual sort of way. So look, today is Tuesday. Cognitive assertion, right? That could be true or false. Uh, it's partly sunny in Lethbridge right now. It could be true or false, right? Now that one's tied to time, so it gets a little bit tricky, uh, but you know, it could be true or false. All sorts of other things can be true or false. You know, I'm wearing a gray shirt. I'm talking to my computer right now, etc. These can all be true or false. Now, some sentences, right? Some things we say aren't true or false. They just aren't true fact. Commands and questions are like this. If I ask you sincerely, how are you doing? Or I, I ask you, you know, please turn the video up. Uh, those, those statements mean something, but they aren't the kind of things that admit of being true or false. This is exactly what Klemke is trying to distinguish here. He's saying, okay, when we take this claim up at the top, there exists a transcendent being or ultimate with which man can enter into some sort of relation. He's saying, I'm taking this as something that can be true or false. This isn't an expression of feeling. This isn't uh, trying to convey some kind of attitude, but in language that makes it sound like it is the kind of thing that can be true or false. Um, he says, I'm, I'm taking this as sort of a standard sentence that's, that's true fact, that's cognitive. Uh, just going back for a second, those forms of non-cognitivism in, in things like moral semantics, really what they're trying to do is provide a way of interpreting what people say when they're uh, expressing statements about morality and values uh, without admitting that those, that those statements are really true or false. Right? So it's a way of, of trying to analyze, think about values uh, without actually admitting that value statements are really cognitive or, or true fact, right? Um, so, you know, things like murder is wrong on a non-cognitivist account, if we utter that, really what we're trying to do is express our own distaste or dislike or horror at murder, not actually express something that's true of the world. Okay, 
So now that we've got this distinction under our belt, which I think is a very useful one to have, uh, Klemke asks, what sorts of reasons do we have to believe that that first thesis is really true? That there exists this transcendent ultimate and that humans can enter a relation. He says, ultimately, there just isn't any, right? Um, he says, you know, religious texts are really just kind of hearsay. What they tell us is that some other people, typically a very long time ago, believed something, right? They believed that they uh, spoke with supernatural beings or believed that they had a certain uh, kind of connection or believed that the world functioned a certain kind of way. Uh, but that doesn't actually give us reason to believe those things are true. It just gives us reason to believe that some of those other people believe that those things were true. Um, philosophical arguments, he says, really don't do the trick. So there's a very long history of philosophical arguments um, designed to prove that the ultimate exists or that the universe operates a certain kind of way. Klemke claims they really just don't work. They don't provide any good reason. Uh, he also claims that, just as a matter of fact, many theologians, uh, you know, sort of moving into the, the 20th century, um, have, have sort of admitted or just sort of given up on those sorts of arguments as really uh, providing reason to believe in the claims of religion. Rather, they are expressions of a, a certain sort of belief, but really it's, it's a matter of faith whether or not we believe in these sorts of things. It's not gonna be a matter of rational argumentation. Uh, and religious experiences, also, Klemke says, really don't give us good reason to believe in this initial thesis, you know, that this transcendent being exists and we can have some kind of relationship with it. Um, here again, religious experiences and accounts of them just tell us that at least some people have had unusual experiences of a certain sort and that they themselves interpret those experiences as showing that this transcendent being exists or that there could be some kind of relation with them. Uh, but ultimately, Klemke doesn't think any of the evidence really amounts to much. But really, there just isn't any good evidence to believe this at all. Now, without evidence, without good reason to believe in this, Klemke uh, refuses to, to believe, right? Uh, he says, we typically ask for reasons. You know, before we, we believe something in our every day-to-day -day life, we look for good reasons for it. Uh, and Klemke says that's, that's how he, you know, operates in his normal life. That's how he operates as a philosopher. Uh, and he doesn't see any, any good reason to believe that this being exists. He also doesn't see um, any good reason to have different standards of proof when it comes to the claims of religion, just sort of generally speaking, uh, compared to other areas of his life. So he says, uh, well, okay, let me flip over here. Um, it can be claimed that really this is the sort of belief that is, is appropriate for faith, not reason, right? So there are these interesting questions around uh, what role, if any, should faith play in our belief structure? So generally speaking, when we believe things, we think it's appropriate to ask for reasons and, and believe on the basis of reasons, right? Uh, reasons here being perhaps not synonymous with evidence, but um, being awfully close. Having evidence for something gives you reason to believe in that thing. So generally speaking, we think it's good to have reasons to believe in something. If we take that standard approach and apply it to religious claims, Klemke says, well, the result is that we don't have good evidence to believe really any of those religious claims, certainly not the main one, like the sort of basic claim that there's this transcendent ultimate and we could have some kind of relationship with it. So perhaps we might take up the view instead that this is a different kind of situation. Normal standards of proof shouldn't apply. Um, this, is, this is a special kind of belief or a special area of belief in which believing as a matter of faith is really appropriate. Klemke rejects this as well. So I think I mentioned in the Edwards video, Klemke's, uh, Klemke's piece is a little bit more hostile to religion, I think it would be fair to say. Um, I hope not hostile in the sense of, of seeming overly rude or, or uncalled for, but rather clearly and forcefully articulating an alternative view. So Klemke um, says two things. And this first one, there might be a little bit of um, 
dissonance with something he says later. I'll, I might come back to that. Uh, in its normal usage, he says, the term faith still implies evidence and reasons. He gives, for example, he says, you know, if, if I have faith in someone, um, it's for some kind of good reason. If I have faith in this person and not that person, uh, really what I'm saying is that I trust them because they've got a certain track record. So for instance, I have great faith in my wife. Why? Not because I just sort of shut off my reasoning and, and evidentiary capacity, uh, but because she has a really great track record of being reliable and getting things done. And, um, you know, I put great faith in her. I mean, it's really, we could probably replace trust here. You know, I've got great faith. I've got great trust in her for good reason. It's good evidence. For Second, um, Klemke says, if that's really not what we're talking about, if it's not really a kind of trust, say, um, I don't think that's his term. I think it's just mine. If it's something radically different from that, Klemke just says, well, look, I, I'm not quite sure what it is then. If it's some kind of leap of faith where you just sort of close your eyes and, and turn off your evidence-based reasoning and, and just start believing things, he just says, look, that's, that's not my cup of tea, right? Uh, if that's what you want to go do, well, I suppose. But here I'm, I'm trying to evaluate the evidence and, and the reasons in favor of transcendentalism. Um, I, I don't have and I don't need this other special sort of faith completely separated from reasons. Uh, and there's, I think there's an interesting point here. Clunky's really making this a, a personal statement. This is very much the personal piece where he's talking about his own approaches to these things. Uh, plus, of course, actually trying to criticize the transcendentalism because he takes that as a, a fairly strong claim, right? It's this claim that the only way you can have meaning is if this being exists and there's some kind of relationship with it. Uh, but I think what we can take here is, is really this question, you know, Klumke saying, you know, I don't have need for this kind of faith. Um, and just sort of step back for a second. Okay, what does that show us? Well, at least that's some people, right? Klemke for one, but presumably there are at least some others, right? Which isn't to say it's a majority of people or any generalization like that. Uh, at least some people don't have faith, right? Uh, and don't want faith. It's not that they've lost it and that they're, they're missing it and upset about it, but really what Klemke is, is doing here, and even from the title of the piece, um, he's really affirming that that's not how he wants to lead his life. He, he doesn't have that kind of faith. He lives according to reasons, right? And that's really what he wants, and he doesn't think there's any kind of problem with that. So let's see where this takes us. All right. So that is really the first point, you know, this, this claim that the transcendent ultimate exists and, and we can have some kind of um, relation with it. Clunky says, I don't see any reason to believe that's true. I'm not willing to accept it as a matter of faith, so unless I, I have good evidence for it, I'm not going to believe it. And of course, we could get into an argument about whether or not there is good evidence. Um, I think coming back to something else he says later, if, and I'll just sort of put it out there now, um, if we really have sufficient evidence to make that claim acceptable, you know, uh, like, look, Lethbridge is south of Calgary. There's a, just an everyday kind of claim. There's nothing particularly special about it. We could provide good evidence for it. Everybody really ought to believe it. Um, if they are holding some particular belief about the physical location of Lethbridge relative to Calgary, uh, there, there's really not widespread disagreement on it. You don't need to have faith that Lethbridge is south of Calgary because we can marshal sufficient evidence really for the belief that it's south of Calgary. So if we have sufficient evidence for, say, the, the initial thesis that the transcendent ultimate exists and that we can have a relation with it, then it doesn't seem like faith really needs to play any particular kind of role there. Um, so this is something else that Clunky effectively says, though perhaps doesn't quite come out in, at this part in the piece, but I'll just say it. Okay, so moving on to this second um, thesis itself, having sort of three subcomponents to it. Without a transcendent being and, and some kind of relation with it, human lives cannot have meaning, purpose, and integration. Clunky is going to look at all of these and argue against each of them. So, first, meaning. Here, Klemke distinguishes between objective and subjective meaning. We had a similar distinction with Edwards, though I think the way Klemke 
uh, makes it is, is a little bit different. So there's one, one thing to keep in mind and, and just one note I wanna make here about um, philosophical writing and, and your own writing and critical responses, forums, um, anything, right? Think, think beyond the course as well. One thing that I press you to do is to clearly define the terms that you're using. Why? Well, um, one, to make sure you're clear on what it is, right? If you've got some sort of technical term or, you know, you're trying to draw a distinction between two things, try to make it clear for yourself, try to make it clear for your reader, in part because different people can mean different things when they're using the same terms. So in this course, we're gonna see this, this sort of distinction crop up quite a few times. We're gonna see it, I, I think, at least once more, if not two or three times more with, with different uh, people. And they might mean somewhat different things by it. Right, making this objective subjective distinction. And we often make this kind of distinction between something that's merely subjective or something that's objective. And there's always an interesting question, what exactly is the difference, right? What does it mean when we say this thing is subjective or that thing is objective? And we, we should be able to say something more than that. Right? So objective meaning, according to Klemke, does not depend on individual valuation. So he puts it this way, he says an objective meaning, if there was, uh, if there were such, would be one which is either structurally part of the universe, apart from human subjective evaluation, or dependent upon some external agency other than human evaluation. Well, uh, we saw William Lane Craig make a very similar uh, distinction about this concerning objective values. He said objective values are really ones that go beyond mere uh, human opinion or, or human belief, right? There, there's something else that really sets what those values are. Now, Klemke himself says that there's really two, two ways we can have objective meaning. So it's, it's always gonna be beyond, be beyond um, individual belief and evaluation. So it's not just what I think or you think or something else. It's gonna be beyond that says, but it might be some other being's evaluation thing. So it might be, you know, the ultimate or gods or whatever we want to call that. He says, but another possibility is that it could just be part of the universe. So we're going to come back to that point in a moment. Subjective meaning does depend on individual evaluation. So when we're talking about subjective meaning, we're really talking about what I think or you think, what it means to me or you or us or them, or we want to carve, carve up those distinctions. Uh, and so this is really the distinction Klemke's making with objective, subjective, right? Subjective is really individual. I think that would be a good synonym, individual meaning, right? Uh, or perhaps meaning to the individual. Because of course, we could think about the meaning of an individual in an objective sense. An objective meaning really goes beyond our uh, particular views. So I was just uh, talking about objective meaning, uh, just coming back to those points. first. Klemke says that it's, it's plausible, or at least possible, that there could be an objective meaning even if God didn't exist. Uh, and that, that might seem a little bit odd, but really what he's getting at is that it could be just somehow part of the universe, right? He says, if the notion of objective meaning is a plausible one, then I see no reason why it must be tied up with the existence of a transcendent being. Right? Instead, it could just be somehow part of the universe. And here, I, I think we can come back in, in a little sense to some of Nozick's claims, but I'll just sort of leave that in its kernel form. Uh, the second point that he makes is really um, just that he, he finds it really hard to comprehend what objective meaning is really supposed to be. Uh, and he sees no, no evidence, Right? No reason to believe it exists, so he doesn't believe it exists precisely because he refuses to believe something unless he has good reason to do so. So on the second point, he says, I find the notion of an objective meaning as difficult to accept as I do the notion of a transcendent being. Therefore, I cannot rely upon the acceptance of objective meaning in order to substantiate the existence of the transcendent. So Klemke doesn't think we can use the existence of transcendent meaning as a reason to believe God exists. Why? Because Klemke thinks it's, it's, there's just as little evidence or it's just as hard to comprehend um, what objective meaning is or, or to see um, that it exists, 
God. Uh, we, we have just as little evidence there as we do for the existence of God in the first place in his view. So he says you can't appeal to objective meaning and say, well, um, you should believe that God exists because there's objective meaning, and for there to be objective meaning, God has to exist. Right? Klenke says, look, I, I don't see reason to believe either of those things. So you can't try to take some kind of shortcut to God's existence by pointing to the existence of objective meaning instead. Okay. Um, one more little point on, on the subjective meaning here. Uh, Klenke says, if I were to characterize the universe, attempting to give a complete description, I would do so in terms of matter and motion or energy or forces such as gravitation or events, etc. Such a description is neutral. So here we see Klemke uh, endorsing that, that secular scientific worldview that people like Bayer and Russell were talking about. Even though we might talk about um, we, you know, forces and, and laws of nature, really, in some sense, inanimate uh, things or, or non-conscious things, non-purposeful things. Uh, we can also talk about purposes for things like uh, you know, creatures like us, purposeful beings. Uh, we can even talk in terms of values and meaning for creatures like us. Klemke just doesn't see how that applies to the universe more generally. Right? The universe itself really only admits of, of description. Um, there is no value of component built into it. So he doesn't really see any objective meaning or objective value or um, you know, objective purpose or anything like that uh, in the universe itself. We can talk sensibly about purposes, values, and meaning for individuals like us, uh, but not in the, the grander scheme of things. Okay. One other point that Klemke wants to make about meaning, he really has the most to say about meaning here, and we'll hear a little bit about uh, purpose and uh, integration. Uh, Klemke does not believe that it's necessary to have faith in the transcendent to find any meaning whatsoever. Just minimally, at least anecdotally, he says, I know of many humans who have found a meaningful existence without faith in the transcendent. Right? So if it's taken as a universal claim, you have to have faith to have meaning, Klemke says, well, that's false because I know at least some people who found meaning without having faith. Uh, and given that he doesn't fully understand the transcendent, he doesn't fully understand what it's exactly it's supposed to be, um, right? It's, it's qualities, features, it's relationship to other things and so on. He says he really just can't find um, meaning in it because he can't find meaning in something he doesn't understand. Even if um, nobody had found meaning in their lives without faith in the transcendent, without believing in the transcendent, um, right? Which Klemke says, you know, that's, that's false. I know at least some people have. So it's not the case you have to have faith to find meaning, right? Unless we want to admit, and this is something we'll come back to later in the course, unless we want to admit that people can be wrong about whether or not their own lives are meaningful. I think that's, that's interesting. And this was something that Edwards and his subjective objective distinction was allowing for, right? Because in the distinction he was making and the objective sense, that's where morals came in, right? Subjective meaning was really more about our own particular experience of, of having goal-oriented um, attitudes and behaviors. So Klenke says, you know, even if counterfactually nobody had found meaning without faith in the transcendent, he said, I should reject such meaning and search for some other kind. If I'm to find meaning in life, I must attempt to find it without the aid of crutches, illusory hopes, and incredulous beliefs and aspirations. Now, that's his own way of, of characterizing uh, religious attitudes, perhaps one that we might want to take issue with, but I'll leave that there for now. It's certainly telling of Klemke's own views on the matter. Okay, so moving on to purpose here. Um, Klemke says, you know, he's, he's really quite brief about this. He says, look, very similar points apply to purpose that apply to meaning. Uh, he doesn't see any evidence to um, suggest that there's any kind of objective purpose, right, that the universe itself has some kind of goal or, or um, end point that it's, it's working towards other than, you know, eventual heat death and just sort of the collapse of nothingness. Uh, and he says he, he doesn't see any obvious um, 
purpose from some kind of transcendent ultimate, you know, God or something like that. And he doesn't see any evidence for it either, so he doesn't believe that there is one. Uh, just coming back to the point he was already making about meaning, even if there were some kind of objective purpose in the universe, that itself does not logically require the existence of a transcendent ultimate. So we can separate off some sort of objective or ultimate purpose from the existence of God. He says that those could be two different things. You could, the purpose could just be there somehow, separate from God. Um, right? Maybe not. He, he makes this point. I'm not saying it's a point you can't argue with, as with all things. If you've got good reason to think that it's, it's false, then share it. Um, like Nozick, if there were some kind of objective purpose to the universe, whether it was created by, by God or not, uh, Klempke himself doesn't see how that would automatically give purpose to individuals like himself, right? or, or you or I. He says, even if there were some kind of purpose out there, that doesn't, it doesn't automatically follow that that is our purpose. Um, even if God exists and even if God made it very clear what, uh, her or his or its own purpose or goal was in creating all things and what our role is supposed to be, it doesn't automatically follow that that's um, our purpose or, or what we would want to take on as ours. And here I think this is where we can insert another one of those distinctions and really talk about subjective versus objective or, and we might want to define it in different sorts of ways, um, talk about our own purposes and goals, the things we want to attach ourselves to, uh, things that seem worth doing to us, and ones that are uh, given to us by others, by some sort of outside agent, could be God, might be parents, or teachers, or whatever. Uh, there are the, the purposes other people put on to us, and then there's the separate question of whether or not we sort of voluntarily take them on and see value in pursuing them, whether they provide a certain kind of fulfillment. All right, this last point, talking about integration. So the, the final part of the second thesis of transcendentalism is that the transcendent and some kind of relation to it is required for integration. There are a couple of different things that might mean, which Klemke wants to explore at least briefly. So it might be psychological integration. Um, and really, we think about, you know, what, what do we mean by integration in the sense, um, having everything sort of fit together nicely, right? If, if, um, you're a, a well-integrated person, psychologically integrated, uh, the various parts of you fit together well, right? It's not like you're, you're sort of at odds with yourself, fighting with yourself, um, deeply divided or torn. This would be a good way of thinking about it. So if it's a claim about psychological integration, about sort of being whole and in some sense coherent, um, I, I'll suppose I'll just leave it there. Uh, here again, Klemke just thinks this claim is false. As he says, I know dozens of people whose lives are integrated in this sense, yet have no transcendental commitments. So he says, you know, just as a claim about um, human psychology, if we're, if we're saying you have to have this sort of faith, this kind of relationship in this being uh, to be well balanced, well adjusted, to um, lead a, a sort of happy life, Klemke says, I, I just think that's false. Second, the claim might be about metaphysical integration. Uh, so really metaphysics is the study of, of existence in its most general form. Um, it's about what sorts of things exist. Uh, metaphysical claims include claims about you know, whether or not God exists, souls exist, um, right? are minds separate from brains, do we have free will, and so on. Uh, what, what are causes and forces and objects and so on. And, so metaphysics is part of philosophy. It's also um, certainly part of religion, more generally speaking, right? We all have some kind of metaphysics we carry around with us, the sorts of commitments we have, the sorts of things that we look at. So metaphysical integration is in some sense something more than psychological integration. Right? It's not just about having your, your various desires and feelings and, and so on fit together in the right kind of way. Metaphysical integration is something more. It's, it's sort of about how we fit in with the universe or something like that. But here, Klemke, in, in his own words, he says uh, that he's not sure that he understands what such integration is supposed to be. Uh, 
he just really doesn't understand this, this other point. So if it's psychological integration, he says, I understand what that is. And uh, a commitment to or relation to the transcendent is not required for psychological integration. Right? It might be beneficial to it, perhaps. Right? He, he doesn't roll that out. He's not saying, oh, uh, perhaps uh, people with such a relationship or, or belief have an easier time being psychologically integrated. He doesn't really comment on that. But he's saying it's not necessary. You don't absolutely have to have that belief or faith to be psychologically integrated. And if it's some other kind of integration, metaphysical integration, right, something to call it, uh, he, he doesn't understand what it is. Um, he would, I, I think, minimally want a good explanation of what that's supposed to be uh, before then really engaging with the claim that belief in the transcendent or relation with the transcendent that must exist is required to actually have this. Um, so he, one, as with the, the other points, uh, given that he doesn't have good evidence for it, um, doesn't believe in this kind of integration, uh, and two, even if it was something to believe, there's a bit of an open question about whether or not um, the existence of the transcendent some relation with it would really be necessary to achieve that. As a last little point here, this is something I was saying earlier, um, Klemke really raises some questions for what role exactly faith plays in um, the lives of, of people in our belief structures. Because when he's thinking about integration here, he says there's actually a, a bit of a weird um, observation he makes. Uh, and, and what is that? Well, it's that faith seems to actually be incompatible with integration in some sense, perhaps at least metaphysical integration. Why? Because metaphysical integration as, as best as he can understand it is really uh, being integrated or connected to or um, um, in tune with, you know, I can try to think of some other phrases here, but I'll, I'll leave it at that, uh, say that transcendent being. But if we are, are really fully integrated with that being or integrated with whatever it is we're supposed to be integrated with, the universe as a whole or whatever, uh, all other life, you name it. Uh, then Klemke says it doesn't seem like there's actually any room for faith there instead. So he puts it this way. He says, if someone had complete certainty, no faith would be needed. Thus, faith itself does not seem to be enough for the achievement of integration. And if integration were obtained, faith would be unnecessary. Hence, the transcendentalist view that integration is achieved via faith in the transcendent is questionable. And this goes back to that point I was making earlier. If we already have good reason to believe something, Right? or if we've uh, achieved the thing that we're, we're shooting for, we don't have to have faith in it. Anymore. Right? If, um, look, if I already achieved a goal, I no longer have to have faith in achieving it. Right? it it's done. Right? I, I know, just in the normal, everyday, reason-based sense that it's, it's done. Um, when we talk about faith uh, as a way of believing in something, it seems to be something separate from our normal evidence-based reasoning. So if we already have sufficient evidence to believe in something, it doesn't seem like faith is required. So claiming that you know, we have to use faith to achieve this kind of integration, he says, that, that really seems to introduce this weird distance because if you're using faith, that implies you're already lacking something. You're lacking evidence or, or reasons of some sort, um, or you haven't actually achieved something yet, right? If you have faith that um, you know, you'll be connected with, with other beings or something, well, presumably that means you, you aren't yet there, right? So it's, it's just unclear how exactly that's all supposed to work. Okay. On to the third claim, which I now see I'm cutting off in the corner. Well, that's just gonna be the way it is, unfortunately. So this final claim, Without a transcendent or faith in it, life is not worthwhile. Uh, here, Klemke comes back to objective versus subjective meaning. And he says this claim really only seems plausible if we confuse those two. Um, if there is some kind of objective meaning, um, Klemke says it it really wouldn't be his in the right kind of way. It wouldn't, I'll, I'll 
throw out the phrase be authentically his, uh, whatever his meaning is, is going to have to be the result of some kind of choice he makes. It's going to have to be what he's interested in, what uh, really you know gets him going, what motivates him. It can't be something that's just given to him. It can't be something that's just sort of served up and well, here you go, right? Um, here's the thing you should do. But right? imagine and just imagine that you know counter counterfactually imagine um, we either discovered some kind of objective meaning in the universe or there's a transcendent being of some sort who revealed to us quite clearly what our, our purpose was or our meaning was um, and it was something we had just no interest in whatsoever right? so what um, what do I have no interest in whatsoever I'm interested in a lot of things unfortunately oh um I, I being I don't know um, some sort of fashion model there <laughs> I'll, I'll sure I, I don't really have interest in that um, certainly being famous for for certain things I, I just have no interest in that um, so imagine you know transcendent being shows up says Carl you know here here is your purpose in life uh, I want you to give up on philosophy and go, I don't know, model pants or something. I just, that's, you know, I'm not interested in that. That's not what I want to do. I mean, uh, that would that would make my days sort of dull and uninteresting. It wouldn't motivate me in the right kind of way. And if the being said, no, but that's that's your purpose, that's your meaning, that's, that's why you're here, right? It would be really odd. Uh, and then there'd be this real dissonance introduced into my life that I, I knew on the one hand I was supposed to be doing one thing, Right, because this outside agent was, was giving it to me and had this plan and purpose for me and was more powerful than me and so on. Uh, but then on the other hand, I knew I was really more interested in other things. Right? I, I, um, I was motivated to do different things. I found meaning and, and value in doing different sorts of activities. Uh, then I'd have this real tough decision on my hands. Right? And now there's a further interesting question, not necessarily raised by Klemke, but I think it comes out of what he's saying near the end of his piece here. Uh, which is this question of, can we somehow change our own psychological states to find different or new things fulfilling, interesting, motivating, valuable? If we look at something, well, let's just take philosophy. Uh, well, let's, let's just assume for the moment you don't think philosophy is very valuable. You've had a bit of a taste of it, you know, partway through this course now, and you say, yeah, I, I don't see what the big deal is, right? I'm, doesn't seem worth my time. I'll, I'll finish the course, take the credit, but right, philosophers, ah, funny a lot of people they are. You're, and you'd probably be right about that. I'll, I'll give you that. Um, could you sort of force yourself, or over time, could you come around? Could you somehow talk yourself into it? Right? Say, say I was a billionaire. I'd say I'd pay a million dollars a year if you become a philosopher. And you say, well, I don't think I'm going to get better offer than that, so I'll, uh, I'll try it. Could you, you know, bring yourself around to actually enjoying it and not just do it for the money? Interesting question, right? And, and one I'm just gonna leave out there, this is a, a good question for psychology, I think. Um, but it's a, it's a good question, it's one that certainly seems relevant to these discussions. Okay, so this, this last point about, you know, the worthwhileness of life, um, Can life be worthwhile without um, objective meaning? Klenke says yes. In fact, he's, he's rather glad there isn't um, objective meaning because it lets him create his own. He says, I for one am glad that the universe has no meaning, for thereby is man all the more glorious. I willingly accept the fact that external meaning is non-existent for this leaves me free to forge my own meaning. Now, the result, right? He says, that, so there's no meaning out in the universe. There's no objective meaning. It's not there waiting for you. So we say, you know, what's, what's the meaning of life? The answer can't be, oh, it's this thing out there, right? It's not some plan or, or purpose or what have you that's, that's waiting for us. Rather, it's something we ourselves have to create. But given that it's an act of creation, like almost anything else that, that can be created, we can fail to create it, right? As Klemke himself puts it, he says, some people's subjectivity is poor and wretched, right? 
these are the sort of people who are going to be frightened by uh, the burden of creating their own meaning because they might not be able to do it, right? Uh, he, in effect, dismisses those people, perhaps not in, in an uncaring way. Uh, maybe it is, I'm, I'm not entirely sure. Uh, but he says, such is the fate of the impoverished, right? Look, some people might not be able to create meaning in their own life uh, if, it's, if it's not just given to them because they don't have the right tools at their disposal. They can't uh, figure out what they're really interested in. They can't get themselves motivated. Um, they can't put together a life that to them is worth living uh, unless something else is, is guaranteeing for them or, or providing for them. So, Glemke says, it, it's, you know, it's unfortunate that not all people will necessarily lead meaningful lives, given the fact that we have to create our own meaning. But, he says, uh, it's, it's not a bad thing overall. He says, those whose subjectivity is enlarged may find life to be worthwhile by means of their creative activity of subjective evaluation, in which a neutral universe takes on color and light, darkness and shadow, becomes now a source of profound joy, now a cause for deep sorrow. So ultimately, it's through our evaluating, right? it's, it's through our own assessment of things that meaning and value is created. It's not something out there waiting to be found. So it's through our conscious activity that, that value, that meaning comes to exist in the first place. And so it's only through that that we are, are able to have some kind of meaning in life. So he really sums up and, and closes the piece uh, on this note. He says, in short, even if life has no meaning in an external objective sense, this does not lead to the conclusion that it is not worth living, as the transcendentalist naively but dogmatically assumes. On the contrary, this fact opens up a greater field of almost infinite possibilities. For as long as I am conscious, I shall have the capacity with which to endow events, objects, persons, and achievements with value. Ultimately, it's through my consciousness, and it alone, that worth or value are obtained. Yes, it is a vital and sensitive consciousness that counts. Thus, there is a sense in which it is true that everything begins with my consciousness, and nothing has any worth except through my consciousness. So just with those, those closing remarks there. So, you know, what's Klebke's positive view here? There can be meaning in life through our assessment of things. So it's through our subjective conscious activity. I'm gonna go ahead and go back to this. It's through our subjective conscious activity that things come to have meaning or value because we endow them with it, we give it to things. Things, things aren't meaningful or valuable just on their own, but instead they become that way because of what we do. Now, there are a couple of remarks I want to offer here on the way Klemke closes the piece that he himself doesn't really get into. This, again, is sort of taking what he's saying and then sort of asking some questions and trying to work backwards to, you know, well, what, what's, what's he assuming or what does he really believe there? Uh, one thing is that in those closing remarks, he talks about value, right? Um, so just, just a couple lines of it again, he says, uh, for as long as I am conscious, I shall have the capacity with which to endow events, objects, persons, and achievement with value, right? Talks a lot about value here. So it seems like, for Klemke, uh, meaning is tied to value in some sort of interesting way. Uh, and, and I don't have any sort of definitive thing to say here. Oh, yeah, and so Klemke thought exactly this. Rather, there's a, an open question, I think, left here. Uh, exactly what kind of value is required for there to be meaning, uh, and does there need to be some kind of relationship with, with plans, purposes, or goals? We were hearing from Edwards last time, and he seemed very fixated on, on goals and goal-oriented behaviors. Um, when he talked about meaning, that really seemed to be it. It's really having tasks to pursue. Uh, Klemke here is talking about value, things being in some sense worthwhile or worth doing. Now, things can be worth doing even if they themselves don't have some kind of goal, or at least I think. There's also the question about what sort of value counts. So look, I, uh, um, you know, I can think about particularly good meals, uh, right? Does that make life worth living, having those particularly good meals? 
even if it makes life worth living in some sense, does that make life meaningful? What exactly is the relationship between meaning and value here? It reigns a little bit open. Another question just about value and, and what Klemke is saying here, and this opens a whole door into um, you know, theory of value and, and sort of ethics and, and moral theory. Um, Klemke's talking about endowing things with value. So the universe on its own is valueless, right? He thinks the, the proper description of the universe would be a descriptive one. It's not one that includes values on its own, but we evaluate things and we give them meaning or, or value of some sort. But what exactly does that mean? Does that uh, activity mean that the things themselves come to actually have that value? Or is it only that we mistakenly attribute that value and, and see those things as having some kind of value? So this is where we get back to that cognitive, non-cognitive semantics distinction. When we're talking about things being valuable or not valuable or worth doing or so on, are we really expressing our own attitudes or are we reporting uh, facts about the world that we could be right or wrong about? So, you know, just to take one concrete example, uh, if you and I both watch a movie of some sort, right? On Klemke's account, and this is, I think it's sort of broadly speaking, would be this secular scientific account we've been exploring here for uh, last week or so. The world doesn't come with values attached to it, right? So say the movie exists, there's no fact of the matter independent of human evaluation about whether or not it's a good movie or a bad movie. Say you and I watch it and we come to different conclusions about it. I say, oh, that was a great movie, and you say, that was a terrible movie, right? Are we just really expressing our own point of view? Or if we both you know, assert and we say, no, that was a bad movie, and, and you know, oh, no, that was a good movie, are we actually trying to report facts? Are we making cognitive assertions? And one of us could actually be wrong. Um, if so, how does that work? Right? When we evaluate something, do we somehow put the values out into the world and then they're out there sort of floating around waiting for other people to come discover them? Maybe, maybe not, but um, I, it's certainly a question that seems to get raised by Clemson's account here at the end when he's talking about really producing value and, and producing meaning through our, our subjectivity, through our evaluation. And one other interesting point to note here is that uh, Clemke at least here in this piece makes no connection that I can see to questions of, of morals, right? So we saw this in Edwards. Edwards says, okay, when we're talking about subjective meaning, that's really having some sort of goal that you're, you're motivated to achieve, it seems attainable to you and so on. Uh, objective meaning is um, having that, you know, having that goal, working towards it, it seems attainable and so on. And it's actually worth doing, right? It's, it makes the world a better place or it's, it's good somehow. Um, that was right, the distinction Edwards is introducing. Clunky doesn't have that, though. There's really not a, a value dimension here. So I think there's an interesting question. Even if we think Clunky's on to something, that our subjectivity is important, that our own view of the world really matters when we're thinking about these things, uh, are there other conditions that matter as well? And in particular, what sorts of value uh, are, matter? We're going to hear more about this in the remainder of the course. So um, yet this week, we're going to be looking at, um, uh, tomorrow actually, we're going to be looking at Camus, somebody I talked about right near the start of the course, who has some overlap with Klenke. In fact, Klenke talks a little bit about Camus in his piece. Uh, Camus himself thinks that life can have some kind of value, like Klenke. However, unlike Klenke, Camus rejects that life can have meaning. Right? So. For Klemke, meaning comes with value somehow, in some unspecified way. For Camus, we can have value, but yet not have meaning. So we're going to have to hear a little bit more about that. And we're going to see uh, on Thursday this week, uh, Thomas Nagel responding to Camus, criticizing him. And then uh, next week, we're going to be exploring some views that get into a little bit more detail about what kind of activity, what kind of, of value, or what kind of um, enterprises can give us meaning or give us the right kind of value for a meaningful life. And we're going to come back around to these questions about uh, whether or not or to what extent morals or other sorts of conditions are uh, involved in uh, tempering or limiting the kind of meaning that we can produce on our own.
that's it for today. I hope you're doing well. You'll see me tomorrow in the next video on Kimbo. See you.